This morning, I want to ask you to go to the book of Joshua. And I'm reading from Joshua chapter 2, beginning in verse 9. And I wonder if we could stand in honor of God's word. Joshua 2 verse 9 says, And she said to the men, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt, and what you did to the two kings of the Amorites who were on the other side of the Jordan. Sahon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts melted. Neither did there remain any more courage in anyone because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. Amen. And then if you just continue standing, I'm going to read the first verse of Hebrews 11, which says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, for by it the elders obtain a good testimony. You may be seated. How many know that women are a powerful force in the universe? Amen. Amen. The Bible tells us of many who were courageous, fearless, and often out, acted outside of the norm for women in their day. Perhaps one of the most important acts that they are remembered for are their role as mothers. Motherhood is a reflection of God. Amen? Amen. Moses used the picture of the mother in Deuteronomy 32, of the mother eagle who stirs up the nest. He describes a mother eagle teaching her young one to fly. That, Moses said, is the way God works with his people. As an eagle stirreth up her nest, fluttereth over her young, and spreadeth abroad her wings, taketh them, and beareth them on her wings, so the Lord did lead them. God, like a mother, disciplines us, he teaches us, He pushes us out into the world to use our wings. Some call it tough love. I expect it was as tough on the mother eagle as it was on that little eaglet. As hard on the mother as on the child. And not always a joyful task. So it is with the Lord as He watches us grow and He pushes us and he looks for us to reach out for our destiny and become all that he's called us to be. In Matthew 23, we have a softer image of the mother hen gathering her chicks under her wings for safety and protection. Jesus approaching Jerusalem from the Mount of Olives looks on the holy city and weeps because he would have loved to have spared them from the impending judgment and destruction that was coming on to that city. And he says, oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathered her chickens under her wings, but you would not. Mothers are pictures of the Lord. They are a force in the universe ordained to discipline and develop their children. They are the protectors of their children. Many of the women in the Bible are known because of the children they bore and raised. I think of Hannah and Jochebed, Sarah and Mary. What amazing children. And what amazing mothers they must have been. Mothers are the keepers of the next generation. 
So I hope that we can honor our mothers today and their contributions and the legacy that they have given us. I hope that we can celebrate the picture of Christ's love that they represent in our lives. Our mothers deserve more than a day to be honored. Amen? Amen. So I'm just going to ask us to just stand up and give the Lord some praise for our mothers today. Amen. Thank you, Lord. This morning I want to share some stories about three special mothers. Each were in the lineage of Jesus, all were Gentiles, and all had pretty unsavory pasts. And yet the Lord saw fit to name them in the documents concerning His lineage and the great faith chapter in Hebrews. They are Rahab, Tamar, and Ruth. As we take a look at their stories, we'll discover that they teach us that mothers have a special gift of courage and faith and tenacity. They teach us that despite the dishonor in society, God honors women. Even today, women are not esteemed as equal to men. We don't get the same compensation. In fact, we get no compensation for being mothers. We don't get equal pay in the workforce. We don't even have equal standing in the church. The church often perpetuates the idea that women were not created to stand beside the man, but behind him. That their sin caused man to fail. But my Bible says that Eve was deceived and Adam sinned. All through the Bible, I see the Lord unraveling that lie. And these three women are just an example. Rahab, Ruth, and Tamar were no exception. These women are mentioned because they stepped up, not just as women, but as instruments of God to be used to preserve and carry on the lineage of the Messiah and the people of Israel. How critical was that? Amen? Amen. Second, I find in their story a message for us today. And that is a message of God's grace and forgiveness. You see, in spite of their past, in spite of their sin, in spite of their heritage, God used them. And God wants to use us too. And finally, it's a message to all of us that we are all accepted in the Beloved. Through Jesus, we are grafted in to the family of God. Jesus is not the God just of the Jews. He's the God of all people. He is the bridge between all people and the bridge to heaven. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Father, I just thank you and praise you for the gift of mothers, especially the gift of my mother today, Lord God. Lord, I want to thank you that you have imparted your character and that breasty one inside of us that reflects you that one that teaches, that one that sacrifices, that one that loves, that one that loves unconditionally even when we fail, that one that nurtures. And Lord, I just ask for your anointing today, Lord. I ask that you would teach us, Lord, that you would encourage us, and Lord, that you would fill us with your spirit afresh and anew this morning. Father, that each one of us would walk away remembering the gift that you've given us, honoring the mothers that are still with us, Lord God. And also, Father, that we would come to know you because you gave us the gift of motherhood. 
In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Rahab. Rahab's story begins at the end of a 40-year-long trek through the wilderness into the promised land. Moses has died, and the mantle has been transferred to Joshua, his young servant, who was always by his side. And Joshua sends some spies to spy out the land of Jericho. Their job was to assess the strength of this city. And they quickly learned that without God's help, they could never penetrate or conquer Jericho. But Rahab, a harlot, was in position to help save the Israelite spies to conquer the city and move into the promised land. What do we know about Rahab? She played a pivotal role in the fall of Jericho. According to some scholars, she was a Canaanite, and she may have even been a temple prostitute. We also know that she made linen out of flax, which the Bible records was drying on her rooftop, and is where she hid the spots. Rahab and her family lived within the outer city wall, and her house was apparently part of the actual wall of the city. Some scholars believe that her home may have been like a hotel or an inn where people stay because immediately the, the rulers of, of Jericho, when they found out that these Israelite spies were here, they sent them to Rahab's home to see if they were there. Now the people of Jericho knew about the miraculous events and the conquest of the Israelites. But Rahab was the only resident of Jericho who resolved to bow her knee to the God of Israel. This she did even before she had the opportunity to interact with these spies from Israel. Although the Canaanites had many gods, she had enough sense to know that Israel's God was a God of power. She confesses he is the God of heaven above and earth beneath. The king of Jericho sends to Rahab's house to look for the, the spies, sends men there. In understanding the gravity of the situation and moving with haste, Rahab hides these spies. And she cuts a deal with them. And she says, I'll hide you and, and get you to safety. But you have to promise me that you're going to save me and my family. And the spies agree to help her. She has to keep their location secret and help them get to safety. And she's required to gather all of her family members into her home. And they say, you know, their blood is on them if they're not in your house when we come back because we are going to take the city. And God gave Jericho into their hands. He flattened the walls of Jericho. And yet, incredibly, Rahab's house is left standing. And as agreed, Rahab and her family are all delivered. And they make their home in Israel from that day forward. Rahab is one of two women named in Hebrews 11 as an example of godly faith. We must realize that God shows his great mercy and power through human weaknesses. The passage provides evidence of why God included her in the faith chapter. It's by faith that Rahab did not perish with those who did not believe. Many people would not risk their lives for family and friends, but she risked her life not only to protect these enemy spies, but to protect her family. She was focused on a godly mission and the realization that these spies represented the living God, the God of Israel. She didn't just believe in the existence of God, 
She believed that God was leading these people into the promised land. So risking her very life with no more evidence than just the reports and what she had heard. She risked her life and the God of Israel has given her a place among the great women of faith. Hallelujah. She stated confidently, I know that the Lord has given you the land, that the terror of you has fallen on us, and that all the inhabitants of the land are faint-hearted because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you when you came out of Egypt and what you did to the Amorites who were on the other side that you utterly destroyed. And she received these spies in peace. Rahab was here living by faith and not by sight. For though she saw none of these events actually happen, she had the faith to believe. Her conviction gave her the courage to look death in the face and live. The word says the wicked flee when no one pursues them, but the righteous, bold as a lion. Hallelujah. Rahab went from being a temple prostitute to the wife of a prominent Israelite from the tribe of Judah named Solomon. She gave birth to Boaz, who married Ruth, who gave birth to Obed, the father of Jesse, and the father of David, and from whom David, we have a Savior. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Give the Lord's prayer. Amazingly, a former prostitute would become what every Israelite woman ever hoped to be, a mother in the line of the Messiah. Rahab's story represents what God has in store for those of us who believe. A transformed life like that experienced by Rahab is there for you if you believe. Amen? Amen. Jesus died that you might be free from your sins. If a common harlot from Canaan could become an uncommon saint of faith and courage and receive the privilege of motherhood in the line of Jesus Christ, surely nothing is impossible with God. Hallelujah. Let's look at another sister in the Lord. Ruth. Ruth's one of my favorites because my mom's name was Ruth. She's another great female force. She was a Moabite woman who had the misfortune of marrying into a Jew Jewish family that had lost its way. This family was from Bethlehem. They were in, in the sea of the promised land. Bethlehem means the house of bread. It was a place of abundance. But for whatever reason, there was a famine. And so this family decided to move to Moab, which is loosely translated a dung heap. This was a place that was not blessed by God. This was a place where the people of God were not ordained to be. And what occurred with this bad decision is all the men in this family died and left Naomi and two sister-in-laws destitute without any means of making a living or having a life. How many know we need to be where God plants us? Amen. We need to be where we are. We need to have faith. And this was, this was a, a people who had been through many famines and seen God bring them out. God always provides for his people. So it's not a good idea to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. But nevertheless, God is a faithful God. Amen? Now Naomi is a pessimistic sort. 
She's not your everyday exhorter. When you get in trouble, Naomi's probably not the person you want to hang out with. She tells, you know, the people, don't, don't call me Naomi, call me Mara. I'm just bitter, all is lost. You know, she's, she's just a, uh, looks on the negative side. The glass is always half full, or I mean half empty instead of half full. And Orpha is, is not the one you want to hang out with either. When the chips are down, it's like, okay, no problem, see you later, I'm gone. How many want that girlfriend? Uh, Amen? But then there's Ruth, who says, don't even let death separate us. I want your God to be my God, and your people to be my people. And so they carry on, and, I, and I, I firmly believe that it was probably Naomi that convinced her husband to leave Bethlehem in the first place. And it's probably Naomi, even though she's saying, I'm going back, that was probably whining the entire way, saying, all is lost, we're never going to make it. But Ruth was the exhorter. Ruth was the one who said, we have a faithful God. Amen. And they see a turnaround when they get back to Bethlehem. She has a tenacity and a courage in the face of difficult and insurmountable situations. And that's the one you want to have around you, amen? That's the character that we need to have as, as women. And God rewards her with a new life, with a handsome, wealthy husband who takes care of her and Naomi. Ruth is yet another Gentile in the lineage of Jesus, a Moabitess. He rewards her faith, he preserves her life, and he blesses her with a new life and children. She marries Boaz, the Kingsman Redeemer. Boaz is a type of Jesus, who is Christ our Redeemer. Boaz saves Ruth from a certain death and desolation. Jesus saves us from eternal death and desolation. Hallelujah. And then there's Tamar. Her story is in Genesis chapter 38. Tamar is a courageous individual who took great pains to correct an injustice. Amen. She's married to Judah's eldest son whose name is Er. Er was an heir. He was really bad news bear. So evil that the Lord took his life. And Jewish law requires that when a husband dies, if the, if the husband has a brother, by law, the brother has to marry that wife and give that woman an heir. He then give that brother an heir. So Judah goes to his son, Onan, who is also uh, Er's brother, and says, go and marry Tamar and produce an heir for your brother. But Onan, for whatever reason, decides he doesn't want to give an heir to his brother. He only wants an heir for himself. So whenever they have intercourse, he spills his seed on the ground to prevent her from getting pregnant. And the Lord sees this as such an evil thing that he too loses his life. Now Judah had a third son named Sheila. But the word says that he never really intended to give Sheila to Tamar. Because he was afraid that Sheila might die too. And so he says, Tamar, go back to your father's house and remain a widow until Sheila gets old enough to be married to you and bring you an heir. And it turns out that Judah's wife dies and he takes off and goes to a place called Timnah to shear his sheep. And upon hearing this news, people, you know, people know things, right? And you're not in a vacuum. 
people are watching you. Yeah. And they knew Judah had broken the wall. So I, I imagine the girlfriends got together and said, tomorrow, your father-in-law is in town. And oh, is that so? Well, let's just see about that. Now, this is not the greatest woman of character in the Bible, I have to admit. You know, she's probably about as devious as Judah is. We've got these issues in this tribe. Nevertheless, she goes out and disguises herself to look like a prostitute and hangs out on the road waiting for this father-in-law to come in. Unfortunately, our Mr. Judah decides he has need of a prostitute. And he propositions, not knowing that this is her daughter-in-law, because she has a veil on her face. And Tamar says, well, what are you going to give me for my services? And he says, I'll, I'll give you a kid. I'm like, you know, wow. I'll give you a baby goat. There, there is a, there's a story in that vision world. I'm going to leave you to preach that. <laughs> so she agrees and she says, well, how am I going to know that you're going to give me what you say you're going to give me? She's working this thing. She wants, you know, some proof. You know, put something on the table here that I can certify that I'm going to get this go. So Judah leaves his staff and his seal and his bracelets with her. And they do the do. And then he goes off and comes back and sends a servant with the goat. And they can't find this prostitute. And they're asking all the brothers in town, where's this prostitute? And they're like, there's no prostitute here. And she goes back home, puts on her widow's garments, and acts like nothing happened. Three months later, lo and behold, Tamar is with child. And Israel's not a forgiving person when you're not married and you wind up with child. So they go to Judah and say, your daughter-in-law is pregnant. We think she's been, a, a, been a playing the harlot. What do you want us to do about it? And he gets all indignant, knowing full well what he's been up to. He gets all indignant and says, bring her and let her be burnt. So they bring her before the, the, the group of men. And she says, here is the father of my children. Here are the signets of the father of my child. And lo and behold, here comes Judah's staff, Judah's seal, and Judah's bracelet. Proof positive that he's the God. How many say guilty? Guilty. And Judah realizes right off the bat what he's done. He knows that he didn't do what he was supposed to do. And he says to Tamar, you are more honorable than I. Now, he never bothers her again, nor does he give her his son, Shayla. But she has twin boys, Perez and Zerah. And Perez, rather, is the ancestor of David. So once again, despite all the shenanigans, God uses Tamar to carry on his lineage. You see, Israel would have had its lineage and its history cut off right now in very short order if it hadn't been for these three women. And that would have been devastating for you and I. Amen? Because if there hadn't been a uh, Rahab, there wouldn't have been a Boaz. And if there hadn't been a Ruth, there wouldn't have been a David. And if there hadn't been a David, there wouldn't have been a Messiah. Amen? 
So what do we learn? What do these mothers, these female forces in Israel's history tell us? Their courage tells us that Israel's future is preserved. They all acted without power as women and out of line with the ideas of their day as to the position of women. But they all acted courageously to fulfill God's will. It was extremely important for there to be an heir, and it was extremely important, and every Israeli woman wants to be the mother of the Messiah and want to be in that line. So this was very important to her. Not that she just wanted a child. This was very important. And in the scheme of God, it was even more important. They all had faith in the promise of the Messiah, but the other thing that, they, that we need to learn from this is none of them were perfect. Amen? Amen. They were not saintly figures. Now there are five women that are listed, but these three were pretty unsavory individuals. Amen? One would not suppose that such women would be in the lineage of Jesus. They weren't even Jewish. And yet each are counted as great in the Word. And they are remembered for their faith and for the children they bore and raised. You see, it's not where you come from, but where you're going. It's not the mistakes that you make, but what you're going to do in your future. God looks on the intent of your heart, not the acts of our yes. uh -huh. God is rich in mercy. Yes. See, we humans are, are not rich in mercy. Yes. We, we are unforgiving. Yes. We like to label sin. Yes. We like to yes. make one sin worse than another. All right, then. But our, our righteousness is as filthy rags. Yes. And God doesn't look at us. Yes. And God doesn't deal and look at our sin the way that we do. He dealt with your sin. He paid the price. The only thing he's looking for is for us to acknowledge that we need to save and believe. God has a plan for every one of us. And it may be a rocky road. It may be up the back side of the mountain. But God is faithful and He will see you through to victory. Amen. He knows how to take your mistakes and turn them into something good. He knows how to give you a second chance. Amen. You don't focus and dwell on your mistakes. Dwell on the God who lives inside of you and wants you to succeed. Dwell on the God who's forgiven you. Remember the harlot that was thrown at his feet. He said, daughter, where are your accusers? I don't condemn you. So the question is, why do we condemn one another? Amen? Why do we close the doors to our churches when our daughters don't do what they're supposed to do? And when our sons fall short of what we believe? Why do we think they ought to be outside the church instead of coming in to the Lord's hospital to be healed, to be nurtured, to be loved, and to be given that second chance? That's what the church ought to be. We ought to be the picture of compassion and mercy. And this ought to be the place where we can come. And somehow we seem to forget our our fail, you know, our failures when it comes to our children. We seem to be able to look at other people's kids and go, well, look at that. When we could be the only Jesus those kids will ever see. We need to fix it, saying every every seat ought to be fixed. The doors are open, but are, are we open? That's the question. 
everyone is a candidate for God's grace. These women weren't from the right families. They were from foreign lands and they worshipped foreign gods. They were prostitutes. They were devious. But God makes no mistakes. God is not concerned about your past. He's concerned about your future. The good news is that Jesus came to the world to save us from sin. The goodness is that he didn't come to make a religion. He came to have a relationship with you and I. The good news is he didn't come to make you pious and, and all do, just doing everything right. He came that you might be saved and have eternal life. Amen. As strange as it may seem, the worse you are, the better the candidate you are for the grace of God. Hallelujah. He came to do for you what you could not do for yourself. He came to save you from your sins. These mothers tell us a story that we're all accepted in the beloved. I want us to put our hand on our heart and say, I'm accepted. In the I'm accepted in the beloved. God loves you, people. God loves you. We have an opportunity today to become a part of the family of God. And I'm going to ask Bishop Roll to come up as I'm closing. I know we're all ready to eat, and the, the brothers have been down there slaving. But I want to invite you, if you're here today and you don't know the Lord Jesus, if you're here today and you've heard the word, you, you, you know all about it, but you somehow don't think that you're worthy, somehow that you don't deserve the grace of God because of your past, you think maybe you've messed up so bad that even God can't reach you. I'm here to say there's no sin too bad that God can't reach you. And the altars are open today for you to come and know the living God. There is a grace for you today. His mercies are new every morning. Maybe you're struggling with a shortcoming. Jesus wants to strengthen you and make you an overcomer today. You just have to believe. You just have to receive His grace and His goodness. I want some of us to make our mothers proud today. Because we've been hanging out, we've been going to church. Some of us came today just because it's Mother's Day. But it's time to not just be here just because it's Mother's Day. It's time to be here because we're the family. And Jesus has something for you today. Amen.